to Aura Freedom. Oh, my video was not on. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to Aura Freedom's webinar on a diplomatic genocide, violence against Indigenous women and girls in Canada. Today, we'll be conducting an important conversation um, in hopes to spark true solidarity with the Indigenous community of Turtle Island. This is a crucial practice of active listening that must occur as our indigenous partners have stated, nothing about us without us. This is where we start our allyship. And this is where we understand how to restore the power through indigenous led actions. We are here to talk about the violence against indigenous women and girls that has resulted to genocide of the thousands of murdered and missing indigenous women and girls. Um, I want to flag to folks that there are social workers and community supports on this call. This subject matter is heavy and can be triggering for folks. So if folks want to reach out for support, please do so by privately messaging me on the chat, Asha, and uh, we will get back to you. Or you can email me at asha.orfreedom.org. I will be putting that in the chat box. But with great honor, I want to introduce Elder Pat Green, who will be opening the event for us today. So I welcome Pat. Good morning, everyone. Um, am I on? Yes, yes, you are on. Okay, all I see is my, uh, my, my name up there. Anyways, thank you for, uh, for inviting, to, inviting me to, uh, to do this opening. Uh, there's so many things I want to say and so many things I want to share and you know, I want to apologize on behalf of uh, all the men from from my clan and all the men from my nation on the uh, the learned the learned abuses that we have carried on for for some time for 250 years uh, the things that we're going through our uh, our, our learned behaviors uh, you know, I, I, I recognize uh, the 250 years of uh, abuses in residential schools where, where our young people were taken away from us and, and uh, taken, sent away hundreds and thousands of miles away to, uh, to a place that, uh, that was not their home and where they were abused physically, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally. 
and, and they did it so well that it became commonplace. They, they did it so well that we continued on into, uh, into our own communities and our own families. But the worst part is that we continued on within ourselves. <clears throat> and I suppose that's the, the need for my, my, my need to apologize for, for what men have done and, and men continue to do to, uh, to, our, to our women in our communities and in our families. Over my time, I, I woke up uh, at, at three, four, five years old and, and witnessed uh, violence within my family as, as, uh, as alcohol entered our, our, our home. I watched as uh, the violence continued in our, in our community. And, you know, for, for the longest time, I was, I was convinced that the Leave it to Beaver family was, uh, was, was represented the rest of the world other than my own place of uh, residence and home. And I was uh, shocked. I was shocked that it's, uh, it's not just within our, our families and our communities, that it's a, it's a, it's a worldwide phenomenon. It's a nationwide phenomenon that, uh, that, that, that's got, has hold, that has had hold on, uh, on, our, on our people in, in uh, uh, building our, our image of our, of our, of our women building our images of our, of our families and uh, uh, each other's in our relationships, males and females. And it's, um, it's near and dear to my heart because I have uh, eight daughters. I have um, three that are, are I don't want to say stepdaughters, but they were, they were, um, they were around before I was married to in my family and I have uh, four daughters that are they're biologically mine and uh, I have uh, three granddaughters I was raised in, uh, in, in a family of, uh, of women sisters and aunties and, and I witnessed a, a lot of those things in uh, you know from from birth, I suppose, right up to, to where, I, where I am today, and I know that it continues. So, you know, I, a great man once said, and, and I, 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 I listened to it, that let's put our minds together and to see what we can come up with for our children. And that's more significant now than any other time in, in our lives. And as I, as I jump up in the air and I look past that 250 years, I see our ancestors, that uh, our, our whole world centered around our, our families and our communities and uh, our women and our children. And, and I long for that. I, I long to have that back. I long to have that, uh, that balanced society where it wasn't patriarchal or, or matriarchal society that it was a balanced society with love and respect and you know, the, the need to continue on with our nations and clans with our children to teach them to teach them that respect of each other and uh, uh, no matter what sex no matter what uh, what nation no matter where we come from that that respect has uh, always been there that we get back to the seven grandfather teachings and I pray that we can continue that. And I, I pray that uh, my children and my, my grandchildren be open enough to receive that and not to be closed, not to close their heart to the, uh, I guess the pain out there and then become callous to it. I, 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 don't, I don't wish that for them. I wish that they uh, continue to, uh, to grow. They continue to thrive physically, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally. So with that, I want to thank you for, for allowing me to be here. And, and my prayers are that our minds be cleared, that our minds be healthy. I pray that our, our emotions are, are clear and healthy so that it makes for a, a healthy place for our spirit to dwell in this bag of bones. So I want to thank you for asking me to, to come here and be part of this. Uh, I wish everyone well, and I wish uh, wish we all go in the same direction and support each other and build each other's spirit up 
enough that it overflows back out into the into our communities so that the rest of the world can actually see how sacred our women are. So thank you very much and uh, I'd love to hear from every one of you. Thank you so much for that, Pat Green. Thank you so much for that beautiful opening to really ground us, to make us present in this conversation, especially that we're having today. I really want to thank you. And I love that quote that you said that let's put our minds together and let's see what we can come up with with our children in terms of building that awareness, building that education piece because of the different violences that we've seen, but really to build awareness on what is it that we can do and how we can combat it by building back that balance, building back that love and that respect. So thank you so much for that. And especially we can't think about building healthy relationships with, with each other if we don't think about how we can repair and build our own relationships with indigenous communities. Um, so I encourage everybody on this call to go on Instagram and different social starts and to start that journey to, to learn from these amazing indigenous advocates and different groups. I'm gonna put some different social media accounts that are out there just to build that awareness. Um, and at this time I want to, um, um, open us with the land acknowledgement as well that we would like to acknowledge that um, we are situated upon the traditional territories of the Hira Wenda, the Anishinaabek Nations, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Mississaugas of the First Nations, of the Credit First Nations. My apologies. And today, the meeting place that we are at, or where I am at, is Toronto, which is Toronto, and is still home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. And Aura Freedom is grateful for the opportunity that we are able to um, empower the women and the folks that we work with today. So again, thank you so much, um, Pat Green. I now want to open the floor to Marissa Kokoris, who's going to go over who we are and our methods. So please, or um, Marissa, if you want to come on. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Elder Pat, for that beautiful opening. And um, you definitely grounded me. Um, feeling really nervous, but good energy. We had um, a, a chat before we started recording live and I was feeling nervous and excited and Elder Pat told me he was feeling the same way. So I feel really good and it's grounding to be nervous and it means we wanna do a good job and we want to be respectful. And that's why we wanted to say a few words, Asha and I, about how we embarked upon this journey of this event and trying to lift up the marginalized voices of indigenous women and how we could do this, we were wondering how we could do this in the most respectful way possible. We are an organization that works to end gender-based violence. We are an organization that works with survivors and sees the ripple effects of violence in communities and the trauma that that brings, but we're not an indigenous organization. So how can we do that respectfully? And it's, as um, Asha said in the beginning, is, is to let these communities who have been screaming for years lead. And um, our platform now is our Relentless Resilience Campaign. And so we just hope to give a platform here and share this information and this knowledge and hope that folks young and old will share this information because this is the way change is made. Violence against Indigenous women and girls is a, a very old story, and it's a story of who is valued more and who is valued less. And this can be unlearned. This can be these, these themes of who is worthy and who is not worthy. Um, this is all learned behavior, as Elder Pat said. So our campaign and what we do in a nutshell is work to eradicate gender-based violence through education. And that's why we're here. So I always like to ground myself and remind myself and share a bit about why I do the work that I do. And I always do this. Um, Asha and our team here, they know that I always look back to who came before me. And in the top right, that's me and my mom and my nonna and nonno, um, my grandparents there who came from Sicily in 1960, and um, my family and where I come from 
is the foundation of my strength. And my story is not free of violence. My story is not free of addiction and being a part of the shelter system. A lot of those things happened in my family as well, but it's those strengths that came from those situations that came from really my mother and my grandparents that bring me here today to talk to other folks in the community who are working to do, we're all trying to do the same thing. So um, in the middle, there is um, my husband, Marco, and my daughter, Joya. And now it's about her. It's about creating a world that I want to be better for her and creating um, a conversation for her to carry forward in her own life. And so I, I, when I wrote Relentless Resilience, I only wanted to bring the voices of the grassroots front and center. Never mind the legislation, never mind what policymakers are talking about. Let's talk to the grassroots. And some of those amazing people are here on the call today. And we've also um, embarked on new partnerships too, which we'll talk about. And now I'll pass it on to Asha to introduce a little bit about her. So hello again, everybody. Thank you so much for that, Marissa. I wanna you know, introduce who I am. I started speaking and didn't give an introduction. So my name is Asha Dahid. Um, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm the Community Engagement Manager here at Aura Freedom. And just like what Marissa was saying, and really um, the conversations we've been having too and how Pat opened it up, we need to kind of uh, situate ourselves on who we are and kind of open ourselves to this moment on who we are and like, why do we do what we do and how do we um, really involve in ourselves in this whole conversation? So here, as you can see in the pictures, um, I am first generation Somali Canadian. And um, the, the reason why I do the work that I do is to really continue to bring awareness and to bring advocacy and education to this kind of conversations that we're having, um, especially with the conversations that we're having today to really just build awareness on it. And the biggest thing that I can take is um, we can't start to do what we need to do unless we really check in with ourselves and ground ourselves with who we are and especially myself coming here as a settler and acknowledging that and holding space for the amazing folks that we have today as speakers. So um, I want to thank everybody and again welcome you all. Um, I want to bring the floor back to Marissa who's going to go over our Relentless Resilience report and our campaign, um, especially the one that we have now in collaboration with the Native Women Resource Center. Um, so giving it back to Marissa. Thank you, Asha. So I'll give a really brief um, elevator pitch uh, version of what Relentless Resilience is. And it's really just a grassroots movement to end gender-based violence in Canada. We are talking about all forms of gender-based violence from intimate partner violence and domestic violence to sexual violence to violence against indigenous women and girls to forced marriage. We're talking about different forms of violence that all women experience. But in that, we're trying to really lift up and highlight the marginalized voices like indigenous women and girls and two-spirit folks, like migrant women and like women of color and, and single moms and, and all of the women who've been forced to the fringes of society. And we want to raise their voices. Now, it's not a campaign um, for folks in the sector. We're hoping it's for the average person to really educate what we do is go deep to the root of the causes of gender-based violence, the patriarchy and gender inequality and systemic racism and colonialism. And these, again, these behaviors that we believe um, education can, can change. So if uh, you wanna know more, please follow us online. The, the movement kicked off in October. It was actually supported by the government of Canada for, um, for a few months and now we're hoping to take this uh, ball and keep it bouncing and it's aurafreedom.org slash relentless resilience a part of this campaign um, which has launched this week on monday was done in partnership with the native women's resource center of toronto and pamela couldn't be here today because of a conflict of schedule but we created some pieces together some videos and some digital artwork, which we're, we're posting on our social media feeds um, and, 
and other channels. We're hoping that with these pieces, which you'll find if you follow us, that folks will share this knowledge. And, um, you know, we are all in our own ways knowledge keepers of what we know um, from our own communities. And so we're sharing what Indigenous community leaders are telling us and hoping that these things and the, this information will be shared. Here's a quote from Pamela, who's the Executive Director of Native Women's Resource Centre of Toronto. And I told her I would read this quote by her today. And there have been systems designed to kill the Indian in the child, to break the spirit of our culture, and sadly, that has resulted in the stealing of lives and the stealing of the breath of our sisters. And these systems are not gone. They have taken new forms, and the outcomes are the same. And it's critical that an examination, a dismantling, and a reconstruction of systems occur. And this process must be Indigenous-led. This must occur to ensure that Indigenous lives are empowered and respected. And this is how we right wrongs. And this is how we proclaim that Indigenous women are sacred. Indigenous women are life givers, water protectors. They are balanced. They are strength. They are sacred. And, you know, this quote really spoke to me because in so many cultures, in, including my own, women are the backbone. They carry the families on their backs, don't they? And the communities. And when you break a woman down, you break everyone down around her. And so if we can work to build women and girls and two-spirited peoples back up, then we'll all benefit. Another trauma counselor and frontline worker wanted to share this from Native Women's Resource Centre of Toronto. What keeps me in the field? I'm committed to enhancing the well being of Indigenous women impacted by colonization and intergenerational trauma. I'm able to empower my clients and to have a voice for all women who cannot advocate for themselves. I have a passion for helping others and sharing my life experiences. And knowing that if we, as an agency, are able to provide women with support in accomplishing their goals, and I get to be a part of that process, that is what keeps me going. We're going to play a short film now. It is an educational film, so there's some reading to be done. And the song used for this um, film was offered to us by um, a local Indigenous performer, and you will see their name so you can actually look them up. And so this is actually um, a local song that we're going to play behind the movie. We have a couple movies for you. And again, they're very short, just educational movies because we are talking about the genocide of violence against indigenous women and girls. So if you could follow along. Thank you. 
Again if, anyone, again, if anyone wants to reach out, um, our topic is heavy today. Uh, we do have social workers and counselors here who you can reach out to. You can um, privately chat with Asha and she'll send you some information of how to connect. Um, you know, when we started creating the Indigenous segment of this campaign, I, and while I was writing Relentless Resilience, which is a report that this campaign was born from, I, I found out or I, I knew that the total number of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls and Two-Spirit peoples is still not known. And to me, this in itself speaks volumes. And to me, that was the saddest part because it meant that Indigenous women and girls were not even important enough to count or to search for. And if you can think about that, then you know that the reasons behind that were you know, not coincidental and were not accidental. It means that the pain and the cries of their families weren't even important enough to consider. And to me, as a settler, this is Canada's greatest shame. And this is why um, Relentless Resilience has such a large Indigenous component, because how can we talk about violence against women and girls if we don't talk about violence against Indigenous women and girls in Canada? And fa facts like this, that they're 12 times more likely to be murdered. That's not okay. 12 times more likely. I love this quote that Pamela shared with us for the campaign. And she said, we, we have to have this quote in there. And it's by Art Solomon, who's an Ojibwe elder. And he wrote, the woman is the foundation on which nations are built. She is the heart of her nation. And if that heart is weak, the people are weak, right? If her heart is strong and her mind is clear, then the nation knows it's strong and knows its purpose. And the woman is the center of everything. And that's not to say, I don't think what Art meant to say was that women are more important, but that often they are the center of everything in their communities, right? And in their families. And once again, when you're breaking that center down, you're breaking everyone down. Another video we would like to play is a video on birth alerts. And I'll give just a brief, brief introduction on birth alerts, but the video will explain it. And birth alerts in Ontario still existed until last month. And again, while we were researching for Relentless Resilience, um, we found out just how recent um, this genocide still is. And so we'd like to play this video about birth alerts. Wait. 
Um, we have a few different movies, more than, than a few, that I encourage everyone to follow um, via our social media campaign and other initiatives like this event. Um, but what we want to do through our next speakers is really set the stage and show the average person on Turtle Island who doesn't know any of this information, um, how this genocide of violence against Indigenous women and girls came to be. It didn't just happen. And this stat, another stat, how just shows um, the, the, the crisis of Indigenous children in foster care. And this, I really want to bring this one home. This is grassroots knowledge from the front line. And we know um, in, in Aura Freedom's organization, as well as uh, sometimes we do um, refer Indigenous youth to services, but this is coming from the front line from um, Native Women's Resource Center and other organizations that many Indigenous girls' first point of entry into the criminal justice system is an offense committed while they were in a child welfare facility, okay? So maybe they're charged with assault on a staff member or get into a fight or something like that um, and are sent to detention centers. And at these detention centers, um, they meet recruiters who are working for traffickers and they're often being exploited themselves. We'd like to say that these recruiters are often being exploited, but this is where a lot of trafficking happens. And given the rate of Indigenous girls that are in foster care, their overrepresentation in the child care, in the child welfare system, literally leads to the overrepresentation of them in the sex trade and in the criminal justice system. And this is part of the, the puzzle. And we have to speak about these grassroots accounts. Because again, the grassroots knows what's, what's happening. They're the ones who are providing the services. And we'd like to go to the next human trafficking stat. There, there are a lot. Again, the, this segment will be going for the next two weeks or so, and please follow. But many um, Inuk girls and young women are lured to southern cities like Ottawa, with hopes to find a better life, have um, a better future, escape poverty and other barriers they face. And they're often trafficked as well and lured into trafficking situations. And 43% of indigenous, excuse me, identified respondents of the TransPulse project, which was a really amazing project, check it out have experienced physical or sexual violence motivated by transphobia, half, half, you know. And we would just, again, 
really like to share this information, share the grassroots accounts, and thank our partners at the Native Women's Resource Center of Toronto for allowing us to be a part of something um, really so beautiful and powerful together. Um, and I will stop there on the campaign because we, um, we have to move on to our speakers. We want to move on to our speakers and we don't want to give too much away because we want you to follow our campaign. So please do. And I'm going to hand it back to Asha now, who has a very special performance that was done um, for us. Thank you so much for that, Marissa. And thank you for really educating us on the genocide that is happening within the Indigenous community. And what really stuck out to me is one quote that said, the Canadian government has a lot to do. And that is true. And it's also important for all of us as settlers on this line to continue to educate ourselves and to learn about how we can become allies with Indigenous communities. I encourage everybody to check out our Relentless Resilience campaign on our socials. We, like Marissa mentioned, we have collaborated with the Native Women's Resource Center on several posts. So please continue to educate yourself. This shouldn't end here. This should be the entry point and this conversation should continue. I now wanna play a video um, who is actually a friend of one of our board members, um, Scott Norton, who is a grass dance uh, performer. So please, let's take a moment to um, um, enjoy this performance. Scott wanted to do this live, I just want to come in and say, but um, he, he couldn't be here due to, to work because he's working, but he, did, he recorded this for us and there's a surprise in the video as well, you'll see about halfway through. proud to be an Anishinaabe man. I have been asked to dance and part of the Aura Freedom Relentless Resilience campaign. And um, I am going to dance um, today for the missing murdered Indigenous women and girls and the two-spirited people of our nations. Um, as well today, alongside me, I will have my two-year-old son, Desi DeWagon, dancing as well. See me glitch.
Wow. Wow. Sorry for those um, back, the back voices, but that was beautiful. And I really want to thank Scott for really um, sending over the grass stance that he did. And it was so beautiful to see his son following along with what he was doing. It was truly beautiful. Um, so thank you so much, Scott, um, for sending over that video. I know, like Marissa said, he wanted to come and do this live, but we still appreciate um, you sending it over and having folks see that beautiful grass dance. I now want to open the floor to Melissa Compton. Um, she will introduce herself, but Melissa will be going through the historical context of colonization and the timeline of genocide as it pertains to violence against um, indigenous woman. So please welcome Mel, <laughs> if you want to come on. Hello everyone. Kwe. Nin Talawizi, Mel Giganat, Madiz, Eshnik Jagamich. My name is Mel, or I go by Mel, um, and my name in my language is Strong Tree Spirit. I am Mi'kmaq from the East Coast provinces, and I've been doing frontline work for about six years, like immediate frontline, and then about six to seven years prior to that, I was a peer support worker. Um, on the screen, those are some of the quote unquote titles. Um, but one of the things that I did want to highlight is um, being a jingle dress dancer. Uh, we just watched uh, an amazing grass dance um, special. And one of the reasons why I got into jingle dress dancing, um, I did have a very vivid dream after I got into the field. And at the time I was a youth mental health and addictions case manager. And you see a lot, like I, I've, I I've, haven't been trafficked, but I'm definitely on the spectrum of exploitation. And with my lived experiences, um, I was able to relate and connect to a lot of the youth, especially the young women that I was working with. And um, this had my, my decision to actually just kind of suck it up and, and deal with my nerves um, was after one year, a colleague and I had lost 22 of our youth in one year. And in order to heal myself and to make sure I was taking care of me, I needed to go into ceremony. I needed to do something that I can not only take care of me, but do something that I could take care of my community. And every single one of those jingles that you see on that dress was me putting a prayer for every single person we lost, for every single member of the community that I had worked with and for and alongside, and people who I also have lost on my journey. Um, and part of the bigger ones too was around status removal. My, my band at the time was going through a status removal process and I'll sort of get into some of those pieces, but that created a huge cyclical cycle um, again for our community around identity and a lot of these laws and legislations that have been put into practice. And so you'll see on the screen a timeline. I'm not going to take um, too long to really go over this slide in particular, but I wanted to put this up because what you'll see is in like the early 1400s was the doctrine of discovery. That was one of the first pieces of legislation that dictated that the settlers that had come over, if they seen pieces of land, it didn't matter if it was occupied or not, if they didn't see any humans walking around the lands that they took it. But that meant that they took everything that was there. It wasn't just the land and settling there. That was, meant the resources. That meant anything that was extracted under the earth. That also meant our women and children. If our men were out hunting, if our men were away, it meant that they took whatever was there. And so that's the start of it. That's, and that's not even the start of it, but this is what is documented as the start of this process. And then you don't see much of anything until mid to late 1700s. So my question is what happened between there and what was going on? And part of what we can speculate is the continuum of the process of befriending some of the indigenous settlements that were happening, but also, I mean, at that time, you, you got around by traveling on the water, on the coast of the waters. And so um, something that would take us a day, I mean, I'm sure back then it would take a number of weeks or a couple of months. And so time was obviously a little bit different, but what I've been told in terms of my community, so I'm from Newfoundland and PEI. Those are my two, the two islands that my family is from. And what I was told in terms of Mi'kmaq history, um, was that 
we, we seen the ships coming off the coast of the waters. And at the beginning, when, when the settlers had showed up, there was a little bit around like befriending there. And that's, this is where sort of like, we hear the talk about the peace and friendship treaties. And I'll talk about treaties in a second, but you were meant to walk alongside your journey together. There was no interfering that was meant to go on, but obviously that's not what took place. And once they had left, they had come back, they'd come back with more people, they left again, they came back with more people, et cetera, et cetera. But in these times, we followed the water lines. Water is life, right? You need water to do a lot of things. And they began to come over and start breaking up our settlements and infusing themselves in between our communities and how we would interact. And that was the first uh, like identification of displacement. We talk about displacement as just being uh, reserve systems or uh, removing our children to go into residential schools, but we forget to talk about often the before. And what we don't recognize, and as you can see here, um, I don't even think they have residential schools on this timeline, but residential schools started like late 1800s, early 1900s. That still doesn't encompass everything that happened before. And, and so we're not, we're doing sort of a disservice to starting at residential schools um, because we're missing the implementation of the Indian Act, which was like, which is and still is, excuse me, sort of like a double-edged sword. Because for my community, we needed it to protect us with our status. We needed it to protect us for the treaties that we have that, and a lot of our communities still have. But it also is one of the most oppressive and racist pieces of legislation that is out here. No other race has a piece of legislation that dictates what they can do and who they are. I'm gonna move forward, um, so next slide. I just wanted to highlight this website. Um, in doing some research off and on, uh, I came across this and it, there's a huge timeline here. It does not encompass everything, um, but there, it is a good resource to go check out um, because it does talk about a lot of these pieces of laws and legislation, but we could be here for months. Um, or Freedom Knows, I like to talk. <laughs> so trying to squish this into a short amount of time <laughs> is a challenge for me, um, but uh, I wanted to show this resource. Next. Okay, so when when settlers started coming over, and okay, so let me backtrack for a second. The reason why we need to talk about this is because we need to understand what has taken place. Because like I said, we often start somewhere in the middle, and we're not talking about what happened prior. And, and it doesn't help give a proper representation of why our women and girls and two-spirit individuals are being targeted at this point. And I think we need to understand like when the displacement started happening, you're breaking up these settlements. And like I said, they took our women and children as part of resources. That is the part of that story. There's when, when you're going in and extracting things from the land, you're raping the land, you're taking the land of the resources that are under there because you're not doing it in a way that we did respectfully. Anything we took from the land, we did in ceremony, we did with the intent, we did it with positive intention, we did it with the with the purpose of survival. We didn't take more than we needed. We provided tobacco. We gave thanks for everything that we took. And we lived respectfully and in harmony with everything, with creation, with Mother Earth. And so when settlers started coming over and they started taking our women and children as resources, there's the beginning of that storyline because in their brain and in their understanding, women and children were property of men. And that was not what our understanding was. We lived cohesively, we lived, everybody had their own roles, everybody had their own responsibilities, but that didn't mean that it was gendered. It didn't mean that one person did something more than the other, but you were held in your gifts that you as a person had. You were honored and uplifted in the gifts that you had. And yeah, you would have been taught other things as well, but you were respected as a whole person. You weren't, you weren't told that you had to be something other than what you were. And then comes the implementation of what we presented as our treaties. If you look at every single one of these belts, um, some of, most of them, and I think all of them, you can see the strings at the end. And there's a purpose for that. That meant that these contracts, because our treaties were contracts, these contracts, contracts never had an expiry date. They don't have an expiry date. They're, not, they're unfinished because they're infinite these treaties were meant to be upheld 
for time immemorial. And one of the ones that um, I was I was provided um, on my journey, one of the first teachings was, and I don't want to give the teaching, but uh, it was around the two, two row wampum belts. So kind of what I had mentioned in the beginning, those two purple lines are meant to show and represent the indigenous canoe and the settler vessel or the ships. And again, you're going on a straight parallel path. You're not intersecting, you're not interfering. You're walking together in peace, love and friendship, supporting one another, but you're never interfering. And we know that that's not what happened. Next slide. Um, again, just some of the treaties. Um, and again, like if you notice the dates, like a lot of these treaties didn't start coming into place until the 1700s. And it, like I mentioned at the beginning, the doctrine of discovery where they put this piece of legislation into practice to say, if we arrive on these lands, we can take them. That, that happened in the late 1400s. So again, it took a lot of time. This is not something that was um, quick. This was a premeditated, very slow process and procedure. Excuse me. And when they realized that things, these things weren't going as quick as they thought, they continued to implement more and more and more. And one of the things that I want to highlight too about these treaties is a lot of these treaties or a lot of the agreements that were signed amongst Indigenous and non-Indigenous people were written in very nuanced ways. So if you think of like, if you have to go to court and those court documents are very hard to read and to understand. I took criminal justice and I still can't even understand them. I have a university level education. I still can't understand a lot of them. They're meant to be nuanced for that reason because there's loopholes. And that is exactly what happened with some of these treaties. That's exactly what happened with some of these policies and procedures and bills that our communities were in a way forced to sign. They were promised something that was not written on that paper or there was loopholes that they were able to get away with whatever purpose that they wanted for. And that's exactly what happened with, with residential schools. Next slide. So I wanna spend a little bit more time on this piece. So starting with pre-contact, you'll see number one in the Eastern direction. And so again, like, like I had mentioned before contact, these were the things that you, you would find. Our children were the heart of the communities. We followed our, our ceremonies and our worldview was strong. Then we move into the idea of contact, power and control over the lands and displacement. And this is where the language breakdown began to happen because obviously we didn't speak the language that they spoke when they came over. And this is where the implementation of treaty agreements and wampum belts came into place. Then we move into sort of the late 1800s, early 1900s. And this is where systemic failure and the breakdown really started to happen and amplify in, in their process. And this is where genocide started taking place. So um, where I'm from in Newfoundland, Mi'kmaq people are not the original inhabitants of Newfoundland. The original indigenous population there is the Beotuk Nation. The Beotuk Nation has been pretty much eradicated. You will never come across a full-blooded Beotuk First Nations person ever again. And many other communities were eradicated just the same. And whether this was purposeful murder, whether this was um, diseases that were brought over that our communities could not survive because we weren't subject to that type of bacteria. Um, it's the same reason when you travel to another country, you have to go to the doctors and you, you get certain shots or whatever else because we're not acclimated, acclimated to that climate. So when you have people come over to another area, it's, it goes the same way, right? And so our communities weren't able to survive some of the diseases that were brought over. And then you obviously, we move into residential schools and some of the things that I wanna mention, and again, reutilize the resources that are being offered because this is a heavy topic. We know how to ration military vitamins and food because they tested this on indigenous children in residential schools. We know what vitamins work and what vitamins don't because they tested this on children in residential schools. Now this is in all residential schools, but primarily these were the things that they use indigenous children for. We were the test subjects. Our ancestors were the test subjects. We know the electric chair works because of this. We know just how long you can survive without food and water and nourishment for this purpose. 
But even prior to residential schools, there was a clause in the Indian Act that talked about um, pushing Indigenous women and girls into specific boarding schools and um, what we want to, I guess, call rooming um, houses. And what I mean by that is a lot of um, my, my grandmother went through this and we don't actually talk about a lot of these things because these stories are still um, secretive and a lot of our community members and ancestors that have gone through some of these pieces are no longer with us anymore. Um, my grandmother was put in like a home where she had to do like the domesticated chores. But while they were there, um, they would try to force them to marry out of their community or marry a non-Indigenous person. And sometimes if you didn't abide by that proposal or that part that was like actually put into your contract, they would forcibly sterilize you so that you would not be able to have children. And so again, targeting our women, targeting our children again. And then we move into residential schools and very similar practices have taken place. They sterilize both our men or our boys and our girls. Many of our community members, if they made it out because there was a lot of um, forced genocide within residential school systems. Um, Pat had mentioned earlier where they sent children thousands and thousands of miles away. They didn't do that at the beginning, but they realized because our children kept running away and they wanted to go back home, they needed to do something different. And so here we here comes another amendment, here comes another rule that we had community members that left my home, my home nation that were flown out to BC. We had people from Quebec that were maybe flown to the maritime provinces. We had people who were from Ontario flown out to Saskatchewan. They purposely flew, well, flew or drove our children province to province so that they could not make it back home. The other piece too is what happens when you remove the heart of the, ch the community. Our children are the heart of the community. Our children are our bundles. Our children are the, are the, the beings that keep us moving forward. And I love to use this example. I use it time and time again. My brothers are the biggest, burliest looking, angry men you can possibly come across. Like they were security guards. Um, they were tow truck drivers. They're truckers. Like they did all of these like, and they're big. Like they're triple the size of me. But when a little child comes up to my brother and tries to play pretend phone call with him, he is the softest teddy bear you could even come across and is the most gentlest being that you could even imagine looking at. But that's because that child, that child that like is pure, who's innocent and who's pretending to make you answer a phone, you, you giggle, you coo with them, you, you play along with the storyline that they're presenting because they don't know any better and you wanna keep them happy. When you remove that, you're removing that peace, you're removing that, that childhood, you're removing those childish ways that you can connect with when children are around. That peace, that serenity, that innocence, you lose that. And when you take, it doesn't matter if a mother is struggling with alcoholism or with substances or trauma, it doesn't matter. You rip that child away from her and she is broken. She, and it's hard for her to come back from that. And so when you have a whole community that has been targeted and children have been removed, how do you expect our community, our whole community to come back from that? It's hard. And that's exactly what happens. So when we have these stereotypes of the drunken Indian, of the, of the oh God, one of the things was, um, uh, go back. <laughs> I'll talk about that in a second. One of the things that I remember hearing when I was growing up was the concept of the Indian giver. And I still to this day don't know what that means, but it, it like just these things, right? Like just the, the I, ideas that come from these policies and procedures that have been so ingrained into us from, the, from years and years and years ago, hundreds of years ago, but it's still happening. These laws are still practiced just in different ways. And then we move into the 60 scoop. This was just another way to push children away from their homes because at this point, residential schools were, it, they realized, hey, like this may not 
be a good thing for our children or for children. And so they moved into sort of the 60 scoop, which meant the same procedure. You were just taking children away from indigenous home, communities and homes and putting them in non-indigenous homes that could be provinces away. And you know what the reason was? Because the mother seems to be unfit. No other explanation. There could be no abuse happening in the home. The children may, be a, may have been dirty because they were outside playing or in the bush, and that was the reason. No logical explanation as to why these children were being removed. There is more Indigenous children involved in the child welfare system today than there was at the heart of the 60 Scoop and residential schools. Our children, like one of the stats had said, only make up about 7% of the population. Our women only make up about 4% of Canada's population. And we are targeted. We, are, we make up about 50, I think the number's now gone up to about 53 to 57% of human trafficking victims and survivors. We are at an increased risk of dropout rates in education and a huge increase in the justice system, huge. Um, in one of the communities that I'm working with right now in terms of programming, um, we have about 96% of the population in the Nunavut jail is our Inuit women. Okay. Um, education is a huge thing. So obviously residential schools, they didn't teach us the proper education at all. They didn't teach our ancestors the proper education. And then you move into today and the process for quite some time. You or our communities receive 30% and over less funding than any other child in Canada. All Indigenous programs receive 30% less funding. This then moves into that domino effect of exploitation and all of these pieces that are not taught, that haven't been taught in our education system that people aren't aware of. And that's okay because you don't know, but now you know, so do better. Take this information and do something with it because this cultural crisis that we've been experiencing for quite some time is partly because of this false narrative. So next slide. This false narrative that comes from this imagery. You look at the old school um, cowboys and Indians films. Half the time it's non-Indigenous actors that are being played and portrayed, first of all, and the storyline is false. The, the other thing that I, I like to use as an example, because I love books, but you look at like the books from the 70s and 80s and it's like this half naked indigenous man that has like an eight pack with long hair blowing in the wind on his horse and then you have the indigenous woman on another book that is being like arms from a white per white man wrapped around her and she's like ha oh, like being saved because she's the damsel in distress and some of the other pieces that i've heard is that especially coming from experience and working in the human trafficking field is that there's a catalog. And a lot of these Johns like to say, I'm gonna pick an indigenous woman because she likes to be beat. She likes, she's rough around the edges and she wants this. I don't need to treat her the way I treat my wife. I don't need to treat her the way that I treat my girlfriend. She wants, she, she likes it rough. Where does this come from? This comes from systemic laws and legislation that have been put into place from the 1700s that are continued to be perpetuated to this day. It's the same reason why governments are still targeting bills and implementing new bills and legislations. I am now classified as a Bill C-25 Indian, bet you didn't know that law. And that's the thing is because people don't know because they don't want you to know. Nobody knew what my community was going through when it started 10 years ago. People still don't because it's a media blackout and they do that purposefully. The other piece is when you look into disenfranchisement, I know in one of the slides I, I mentioned disenfranchisement. That meant that prior to the 70s, any Indigenous woman who married a non-Indigenous man had to give up her rights to status and become a Canadian citizen. And that meant that her children would no longer be able to carry down the lineage of status. 
Now, if an indigenous man married a non-indigenous woman, that meant that that woman obtained full status and the children obtained full status, even though they would, they shouldn't have had full status and that the mother shouldn't have gained status because she was not indigenous. So when you hear, and I've actually started connecting the dots a while ago is when you hear that stereotype of, because I've been asked this, well, where did you get that status card? You don't look, I don't look what? I don't look like what you've been shown on the media, what you've been perpetuated. I don't, I don't fit the stereotypes because that's not who we are. But the other piece to that is you still have older white women still holding full indigenous status because of that clause. Because here's the thing, the Indian Act states, you cannot remove status. But something that's going on with my band is our chief didn't fight to have our bill embedded into the Indian Act because he didn't think he needed to. And now the government has now removed status from 10,000 First Nations peoples from the maritime provinces. And again, perpetuating that cycle and attacking our communities. That lineage gets cut off, so to speak. And so many of our community members and a lot of our older people connect with that number because that's what was given to us. Look up the past systems that happened on reserve systems. You were given a number. Look up where dog tags came from because that's from our northern communities where it's colder. They had to have furs and jackets and everything on them so they couldn't tattoo numbers. They couldn't give a card. You had to wear dog tags in order to be identified by the Indian agents that were going in. These were all tactics that were used to control us and to minimalize the bloodline and to shrink and diminish the bloodline. So I'm gonna leave it at that because I could go on for hours <laughs> and I've been getting the, been getting the thing, but um, yes, check this out. So um, the concept of two-eyed seeing was presented and the teachings were actually provided to Elder Al Albert Marshall from the Mi'kmaq from Unamagi territory in Nova Scotia. Um, and it's this idea to see Indigenous worldview and perspective in one eye from your creative side, and then learn to understand Western knowledges and ways of knowing from your from your left side. And, and part of that is being able to walk in your truth, but also being able to, for us in particular, to walk in both worlds and how do we do that while still staying true to ourselves, but also in, in that reclamation of identity and culture journey. But this also looks at and presents for non-Indigenous communities to hold both and to learn and to understand. And if you don't understand now, that's okay, but that you still have a responsibility to learn and to know and to grow in that knowledge. And, and like I had sort of mentioned earlier, I can't remember where it's from, but um, somebody had mentioned, you know, you know the knowledge now because I've now spoken it to you. Now you've, you've, got, you've been given markers to learn and to grow in that knowledge. And so now that you know, and now that you know better, then begin to do better. So I will leave you with that. And thank you to Aura for inviting me here. <laughs> wow. Melissa, that was super powerful. And I want to thank you, thank so, you so, so, much. so much for really going through the history of the colonization of the Indigenous community. As I am sure many folks have been falsely educated on the truth of the Indigenous community. So this is really an opportunity for all of us to unlearn and to relearn um, the truth. And especially there's one quote when you said, when settlers started to take women and children as resources, that's when the shift occurred. And that was super powerful in knowing the truth on what really happened. And and, um, and really highlighting the deep embedded treaties and policies that created historical barriers for the indigenous community. And when you, and again, I'm gonna, there's so many quotes that I could have grabbed, but I try to grab as much as I could. But when you also said, when, when our community has been targeted in so many ways, false narratives begun to occur, which is the truth. So thank you so much for educating us all again. I want to highlight that it is all our responsibility now to educate ourselves um, more and not just stop at this moment, but to continue this exactly. education. And I love, especially when you said at the beginning where every jingle was a prayer for every single person that every single person that we've lost in the indigenous community, like that was super powerful. And I wanna thank you again, Melissa Compton, um, for really educating us today and opening the floor for us. Thank you, I can't thank you enough. Um, and if folks thank wanna- you, Mel. 
Thank you. Yes, that's just um, Melissa. And if folks have any particular questions for Melissa, um, please put them in the Q&A as we're going to have a section to open it up for folks. But I now want to open the floor to Daniela Robinson. Um, she is an anti-human trafficking psychoeducation and community support at Native Child and Family Services of Toronto. Um, she will introduce herself, but she's going to give us the frontline perspective on responding to the violence and building resilience. So Danielle, I give you the floor. Hi, everyone. Um, I just want to say big thanks to Mel. Um, I was super fortunate and I got to work with Mel um, when she was a frontline worker at Native Child and Family Services alongside me. Um, we called ourselves a dynamic duo for a reason, so I'm super honored to be uh, sharing a panel with her and to be part of this um, relentless resilience campaign. So my name is Daniela Robinson. Um, I'm Big Stone Cree. I'm Italian. I'm a Sagittarius. I like long snowy walks on the beach. Um, this work is something that I am so incredibly passionate about. Um, I'm a survivor of sexual violence. And so for me, when I was going through my healing journey, really not having a I guess what I would call the right space for me to heal, not really feeling like I had the right space to ask questions or to learn or anything like that. Um, it was it was rough. And so for me, education was my saving grace. And so um, I'm now doing a PhD in human sexuality in the third year. And the knowledge that I've gained along the way has helped me to make sense of certain situations that I've been in. And um, it's given me the opportunity to impart some of the knowledge that I've gained in that space, that space that I'm privileged enough to have access to. And I've, you know, in, in sort of developing um, the anti-human tracking program in Native Child and Family Services, which is also known as um, the Bakondadang program, which means being peaceful, that knowledge that I've kind of gained along the way, both in the work that I do now and in previous roles that I've, I've had with community, that's all now embedded in the program. And when Mel and I were first, you know, thinking up things to input into the program, um, we really got to let our imaginations go wild. And now that Mel has left the position and our team has sort of shifted and grown into um, something bigger, it's amazing because now we're finally getting to see some of those things that we really wanted to do. You know, now we can now we can do them because we have the capacity to do so. So in sort of talking a little bit about um, you know, what I've learned as a frontline worker. Um, I've learned that community members who've gone through the kind of trauma that comes with being sexually exploited, um, they don't trust folks and they've been judged a lot by, um, by service providers. And sometimes from what I've heard, the gaslighting that they get from service providers around their stories is almost as bad as, if not worse, um, than the gaslighting that their traffickers do to them. And that's not to say that service providers intentionally need to do that necessarily, but as service providers who work in social work type fields, um, a lot of us get into the work that we do because there's something about it that resonates with us. We want to do better for our community. And that usually comes from us having our own negative experiences. And sometimes we haven't done enough work on our own healing journeys to really be able to do that positive work with community because then we end up making the stuff that we're going through um, into the stuff that our community members are going through. And we end up projecting a lot of violence onto them. And another thing that we've learned is that our youth, our indigenous youth, um, often struggle to have a place of their own where they feel non-judged and in a space where they can ask questions. And when Mel was, Mel does such a beautiful job every time of going over um, the intersections between um, colonialism and uh, trafficking. But all of those things that Mel was describing in terms of um, how Canada, how the government of Canada, how settler colonialism has made our communities vulnerable, every vulnerability that she described from poverty to having status taken away to community disruption all of those become vulnerabilities that a trafficker can exploit and so in the development of our program um, the bacondening program 
we wanted to create a program where people could have a space to find peace within themselves. So finding, finding peace in, in spite of, and sometimes because of the violence that they've gone through, a space where they can kind of imagine and pursue a different path. And we've, um, we've created a few really amazing things. I, I am humble bragging right now because I truly believe in, in the work that we do and in the program that we've developed. But um, one thing that we do is we do um, a trafficking, uh, anti-human trafficking training for service providers. And it's super unique. And from every person that we've you know, done the training with, we've heard that it's something that they've never had before something that is so incredibly interesting and nuanced. Um, we we've divided it into four sections. So the first part of the training is on the intersections between colonialism and trafficking. So, um, you know, some of what Mel shared, that's incorporated into the training. Um, the second part is on healthy sexual development and trauma response. A lot of times um, community members who are really going through it, whether they're in the life or they're at risk for being in the life or whatever it is, um, they often feel really judged by the people that are supporting them or the people that are supposed to be supporting them. So in that part of the training, we talk about what it means to, you know, um, be judgmental of a person's situation and the symptoms of a root cause. If a person has gone through immense trauma in their life and their response at this time is to, um, you know, go into the life, go into the game and um, make money that way because they don't feel like they have any other way to make money. Um, they don't deserve to be judged for that. They deserve to be supported. And so that's a big part of, of the training is, is helping people to self-reflect on what their biases are, especially around um, very controversial, uh, sensitive topics like sexuality. And um, for me, being a third year PhD in human sexuality student, I love researching sex and sexuality. And it's such a passion of mine. And I want the positivity that I feel about that subject um, now to you know, be echoed in, in the hearts of, of the community members that we work with um, in, into this, the folks that we support because often their experiences with sexuality have been quite negative. Um, the third part of our training focuses on um, self-reflective exercises around um, taking a strengths-based approach and, and, and an empowerment-focused approach. And then the last part of our training is on trafficking, what trafficking looks like in the GTA, um, how it affects our Indigenous community members specifically, and um, a set of tips and tricks for service provision. Um, and everyone that we've, we've run the training with has found it incredibly useful. Um, and our new outreach worker, Sandra and myself, have co-facilitated that training for, I think, a couple hundred people in the last uh, two or three months. So it's been pretty incredible. Another thing that we have um, going on is a sex education, sex positive program um, for youth as um, because we recognize that prevention is a lot easier to do than it is to get someone out of the life. Um, and sex positive is, is about education, but it's not just education on sex. It's about empowering people to make choices that they feel are right for them. And a lot of times people, you know, with the amount of information that we have access to, it's really hard for people to sort through, you know, what's what's true and what's not true and also what knowledge is right for them to carry and so sex positive gets to be a space where folks can ask, ask questions um you know participate in a non-judgmental dialogue um sandra's been uh, co-facilitating that with me and the youth love it because it truly is a space unlike any other for them um, we've also run that sex positive program with with um some some of the older women um, that participated in another program, an Native Child, and some of them have gone through ex extreme sexual trauma. And so that, that program provided a safe space for them. We've also done sex positive with um, older community members, like um, 50 and older, um, who have never really had a chance to talk about sex in any kind of positive way or ask questions or process some of their trauma. Um, and so Sex positive, in my, in my view, has been very successful and very well received. And it's probably one of my favorite things that I get to do. Um, we also have a mental health clinician who's very trauma informed, very non judgmental, and has done incredible work with um, folks 12 and up. What we've found recently is that um, with the internet being what it is, there's a lot of 
luring and grooming that happen online. And um, for, for kids, for youth who are developmentally even younger than they already are, which is already quite young, um, it can be quite scary for the families involved. So we do some psychoeducation with the families as well, just around um, you know, trafficking, but in a not scary way. We found that a lot of them will sort of Google and sort of fall down the rabbit hole and they end up terrifying themselves. And you know, the kind of education that we want to provide is um, empowering and supportive and not overwhelming. And it gives them a space to sort of process the trauma of having something awful um, happen to a loved one. Something else that we do um, and that we have coming up is a survivor-led, um, uh, survivor-driven peer program where um, survivors of um, trafficking and sexual exploitation have a chance to um, increase their, their skills, um, their professional skills, so that if they want to pursue other lines of work, um, it's easier for them to do so. It's a res it'll be a resume builder. Um, and because of the trauma that folks walk with, when they've been through that kind of exploitation, we have it sort of set up like a two-part process. So there's like a pre-peer training program. So folks can kind of decide if that's the space that they wanna go. And if they complete that program and it's of enjoyment to them, then the next part will sort of progress to them becoming a peer and being able to work alongside us for some of the things that we do. Um, we also have an intensive case manager who helps folks, um, you know, really navigate the world, um, you know, access education supports, funding supports, housing supports, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and then there's myself, psychoeducation and community support. I work a lot um, with Sandra, who's the outreach worker. Um, we sort of co-facilitate and co-do a lot of the things together. Um, and we recently hired a program navigator who's going to be taking over um, and co-facilitating the peer stuff with, with Sandra and myself. So that's a little bit about you know, what we do, but quite honestly and quite truly, Mel explained it so beautifully why, how and why history has had the impact that it has today. And something that I think is, should resonate with everyone is when Mel was talking about the very slow process of exploitation that happened to Mother Earth, to our communities, um, that's kind of manifested in this culture that we're in now where indigenous lives and indigenous women and girls and community are meant not to matter. That slow exploitation process is exactly like the kind of slow exploitation process that happens with trafficking. And so seeing that parallel is not really something that you can unsee now that you have this knowledge. And so, you know, sometimes we have questions about how folks can be better allies and taking this information and learning more and sharing that information and defending indigenous community, if and when it's safe for you to do so, if you hear something that comes up, um, that's a really important step. Um, there are also some amazing online courses that you can take. I think there's one through um, the University of Alberta. There's also a lot of books on positive um, indigenous sexuality stuff. I've come across a lot of them that I've decided to use in my research for school. And so that's been incredible. And in sort of echoing Mel's um, you know, suggestion and, and beautiful thought on sort of seeing the world with two eyes and walking with two worldviews, Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer is probably one of my favorite books and has been one of the most influential books in my own life. So I wanna say um, chi miigwech to everyone for attending this um, Zoom webinar. Um, Chi miigwech to Mal for doing such an amazing job and Chi miigwech to um, Marissa and Asha for having me on here because it's, it's truly such an honor to be able to share the stage, so to speak, with you folks. So thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Daniela, for that and for really educating us on the Wakanda Dane program at Native Child. I loved how you said that it's really an opportunity for folks to find peace within themselves. So thank you so much. And I love how you really tied in the intersections of colonization and the impact that it has had on human trafficking within the Indigenous community and the beautiful trainings that you do for frontline workers. Um, folks to really unpack their biases and to really reflect on where all of their ideology started for them to unlearn 
and to really learn. And I love how you speak about sex positive and how it really holds space um, for folks to really talk about their sexuality and some of their trauma and to really have space to speak about that. So thank you so much for that. I really um, encourage folks to check out Native Child to get more information on some of the trainings they have and the different resources that they um, have as well. So thank you so much, Daniela, for that. I want to open the floor to um, Marissa before we get into our Q&A. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Daniela and Mel and Elder Pat and Sandra and everyone for being here. Um, I feel the vibe. We all feel it in this room. And um, one of our biggest beliefs here at Aura Freedom is that gender-based violence is preventable. And that it's a very old story, again, of who is valued more and who is valued less. And this thrives in inequity. So, you know, the antidote to all of this is education. If we can advance equality and equity, and keep that education going. We might not be able to see it working in real time, but it's, it's right, it's the right thing to do and it works. And the ripple effects of that education will be seen for a really long time to come. This is how we create that systemic long lasting change. And this is the only way where our freedom um, works. This is the only way we choose to work. And if we're not dismantling the oppressive structures that keep uh, women and girls with a specific attention to Indigenous women and girls today in their um, positions of disempowerment, then we're really not doing anything. Like Daniela said, you know, it costs a lot less to prevent the violence than to respond to the trauma that rips through families and communities. So I want to thank all of the amazing people here today, and we want to open up the floor for some questions and discussion. Um, our kitchen table talk of what's going on, how, how are you feeling, questions for our panelists. And once again, thank you all for being a part of this. Yes, thank you so much um, to the panelists. Thank you so much, um, Elder Pat. Thank you so much, Melissa. Thank you so much, Daniela. Oop, my video wasn't on. <laughs> But I just want to echo that and really thank you for really being here for this moment to really educate us, to help us unlearn and relearn on some of the prior ideologies that we had and the misconceptions that we had. So I really want to honor you all on here and say thank you so much um, for really educating us. And I know folks are very thankful for you folks here um, and the time that you've been giving us. So like Marissa said, I want to open the floor for questions. I know folks have been asking questions um, in the Q&A. They've been answered, but we can go through some of them. But if maybe folks had some more particular questions, I seen in the chat box, um, folks were wondering like, how can they get more resources on um, learning some more things? Uh, Daniela put in a recommendation to a book called Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmer. Um, so I encourage folks to check out the chat bar. There's amazing resources. Um, there's the University of Calgary that's offering a free uh, course and the link is in the chat box as well. But yeah, if folks have any more questions, please um, put them in the Q&A or the chat box before we wrap up our webinar today. Elder Pat has a question. Yes, uh, Elder Pat, please. Well, thank you. Um, I, I've been listening and, and I really appreciate uh, all the concerns and all of the people coming together and working together again, like putting our minds together and see what we can come up with. And I've heard a lot of the things that, uh, that I, I talk about that we are the end results of 250 years of abuses. And, and I heard a lot of talk of uh, how, how we are that today. And what I'd like to, uh, to offer you is some, uh, you know, some consideration that before, uh, before contact that uh, we were a much civilized, uh, uh, we were much civilized people right across Canada and the United States across Turtle Island. And I just want to uh, refer to a, a, uh, a video that I've been uh, using for the last million years since I've been working with addictions and family violence, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the, the video is called More Than Bows and Arrows. And, and I love it because it talks about our contribution to
to today's society. And it talks about our society before contact and how, how civilized we were as a people. The second one is uh, they lied to you in school. And that talks about, what, what, what that one talks about is again, our, our contribution, everybody's contribution to today's society. So, well, you know, excuse the terms red, yellow, black, or white. That uh, it, it's just it's not a, a white man's world. That uh, we all con contributed to to where we are today. So I just wanted to pass that on with you because I uh, I think it's uh it, it's it's necessary for us to look past his story and take a look at our own stories and. We've got thousands and thousands of years of stories, whether we're red, yellow, black, or white. So I just wanted to share that with you. So thanks for paying attention and allowing me to be here. I think it's a really privilege. Thank you so much. Sorry about that. Thank you so much for that, Pat. I love how you said to really take away from his story and really recreate that for what was our story and i love how you highlighted especially of just like you know the the original of what of the indigenous community and the and the true story prior to um all of the historical impacts all of the um policies all of the treaties um that the indigenous community is such a beautiful resilient community so thank you so much for that um thank you and i want to see if maybe if anybody else has some questions. If not, I want to thank everybody today here on the call um, for being a part of a diplomatic genocide, violence against indigenous women and girls in Canada. Thank you for being a part of an important conversation um, in hopes to spark true solidarity with the indigenous community of Turtle Island. I encourage you all to continue your journey of unlearning and relearning. And I encourage everybody to check out our Relentless Resilience campaign on our social media. Um, as for the past next two weeks, we'll be collaborating, and we have collaborated with the Native Women's Resource Center um, on these posts. And again, a big, huge thank you to Pat Green, Elder Pat Green, thank you. A big thank you to Melissa Compton, uh, Daniela Robinson, thank you all so much for being a part of this amazing conversation of really allowing us to spark the truth within the indigenous community to unlearn and to relearn. So thank you so much for that. And I see uh, we one have question. one question. Um, but I see Daniela has answered it. Um, maybe I'll, I'll leave it at that since Daniela has answered it in there. But uh, this is the end and closing for our event today. Thank you all so much for being a part of this. Stay on. Nope. Uh, stay on. Yes, uh, thank you everyone <laughs> for being a part of this. And uh, I hope you all have a beautiful evening. Thank Take you. care. Bye. Bye now. Wait, Pat. We know Pat.